Self-portraits are something we knew how to do when we were in kindergarten, and then we forgot how to do it. So let's see how we can remember. Let's get started. Today, I want to talk about self-portraits and how we get ourselves in the right mindset to do them. Now, if you're a photorealist, this is not the channel for you. But if you like to find big value shapes and forms and simplify things, then this is the channel for you. This is the kind of uh, self-portrait that a lot of us did when we were little. It has essential shapes. There's no ambiguity. It's direct. It's strong. We can all recognize what it is right away. And this is what I want to accomplish when I'm doing a self-portrait or a portrait of, uh, my, of somebody else or of an animal. That, that's what I strive to do, to get as basic as I can get. But let's take a look at some other self-portraits because I think it's important to have a context. I'm not going to show any living painters. I think it's important because that will avoid comparisons. All right, so in order, you know, when we talk about photorealism, Rockwell is not a photorealist, but he's as close to a photorealist as you're going to see me uh, respond to on this channel. And this is a really famous self-portrait known for its humor. All artists can relate to this. It's been parodied a, parodied a whole bunch of times. And um, and this is, uh, this, is, this is a painting. And of course, we, we all know that Rockwell was a, a tremendous draftsman. Uh, I, I'm not a great draftsman by any means. This is more, this is a self-portrait of his rendered in uh, pencil or maybe charcoal. But this is more in keeping with uh, the kind of drawing that is really academic. Uh, I don't have those kinds of skills. I don't know that I want to have those kinds of skills because I'm more interested uh, in getting to the essence of something. But I'm a big fan of Rockwell's. Believe me, I'm, I'm, I'm not being uh, I'm not being critical here in any way. These are these are my heroes. The next portrait coming up is John Singer Sargent. Now he was known for his portraits of uh, the elite at the time. You know he was he um, all of his paintings and watercolors are just so extraordinary. But this one I was not familiar with, and it is a self portrait. And this would be probably the Holy Grail. Anytime John Singer Sargent is painting, that's, you know, where ideally I'd like to be. But we all have to accept the painters that we are. And uh, I'm running out of time. I'm never going to be in, in this category. And you know, he's just, I'm convinced he's a wizard. <laughs> so the next one is, uh, this is Monet. And I think it's fun to see something like this because we don't usually see self-portraits. Although we see these people's work all the time. And we're so familiar with their work. And what's fascinating about this, I think, especially, is that you can see the work as we know his work uh, from the water lilies and the hay bales and Notre Dame and all that stuff. But to see it as he sees himself, you know, these self-portraits really are a portrait of the person, but also of their work. And, um, you know, hopefully when I'm doing a self-portrait, that's what I want to get at as well. Something beyond just a, a, a good rendering. The next portrait coming up is Manet. Um, oh boy, I just love the cinematography of Manet. This is more in keeping with um, really seriously where I would like to go because it has so many lost and found edges. Not that the previous one didn't, but um, there's something about Manet that has always really spoken to me. I think it has to do with his ability to tell a story, which is why we referred to him as cin cinematic. We all know that uh, scene where a woman is at a bar and there's the glass reflected behind her and you see the whole scene of the room. And, you know, we, we see that kind of uh, view in movies all the time now, but that would not have been available to him at the time. The next portrait coming up is Edward Hopper, who I know was not known for his um, <laughs> pleasing personality. <laughs> he looks pretty friendly in this photograph, but uh, uh, from what I've read about him, that was not the case. But, um, you know, his probably his most famous painting is Nighthawks. But we can see that everything is very clearly rendered, uh, not many lost and found edges in this case, and, and so clearly Homer, exactly who Homer is. This one was a real surprise to me. This is uh, Winslow Homer. This is a, uh, I think it's a watercolor on paper. A Winslow Homer uh, can do no wrong as far as I can tell. And I don't know that much about his life. Um, and this does not really resemble his uh, watercolors, but I thought it was really important to see this because we're talking about self-portraits and about artists and about influences. The next two coming up are of Cezanne. 
uh, who is known, of course, for his fruit, and that, what was the name of that mountain? He painted endlessly, like, a hundred times or something. I can't remember the name of the mountain. This one is a little bit more painterly. You can see the strokes in this painting. Um, but if you look at any of Cezanne's uh, paintings, you can see very clearly that this would oh, this would be the man who would have painted them. The next one is a little bit more outlined. Look at that nose, for example. That would be, in my mind, something that I would not want to do in one of my paintings, have something as uh, direct as that line for a nose. But um, but we all know from looking at his uh, paintings, he used, a, he used that device quite a bit. And he softens that with uh, the lost edges in the hat and in the beard and in the uh, clothing as well. And look at the background. There's a lot of triad work going on in the background. It's luminescent. Oh boy, I love that background. The next one coming up is Vincent van Gogh. This is not his usual. I, you know, obviously he was younger, I suspect, when he did this portrait. And his skin tone is kind of flesh colored. And, um, you know, typically in his self-portraits, they were not flesh-colored. They read as flesh-colored because the values are correct, but they tend to not be flesh-colored um, paints applied to the actual portrait. And this is an extreme version of that where, um, you know, he's finding values um, and putting strokes in to mask those values. And that's, that's, of course, if you watch his channel at all, you know that's what I'm interested in. Not as linearly as what he's doing here. This is the photograph that I worked from in order to do the self-portraits that's, that's coming up. It's going to pale in comparison to anything that we saw up till now because, you know, I'm not a great master. But I wanted you to see what the palette looks like because people always ask, what colors do you use for skin tones? These are the colors. This is at the end of the painting. This is what my palette looks like. It never looks gray or muddy. But these are the colors that I use. And so when people say, well, what colors do you use for portraits? I sort of say all of them. For sure, you have to have a red, you have to have a yellow, and you have to have a blue. I mean, there's no question about that. I mean, and then beyond that, you can have a limited palette. But typically, I don't have what you would call flesh-colored colors. So I'm going to try to um, recover the video that I did of this portrait, which seems to have gone fallen into a dysfunctional state in my phone somewhere, and I hope to post that soon after I get some help from uh, someone who knows a lot more about me uh, about computers than I do. Uh, so until then, remember to keep white your paper white, your paint's wet, mass for value, mix for color, and you might want to try a self-portrait. All right, see you next time. Bye-bye.